Do what the will should be the whole of the law. My first channel, Nexus and Dots, is a music channel. Once I started using it, its focus was obscure musics that I enjoy. When I decided to start adding informative videos, I found they were quickly lost amid the music. Thus, I split off a secondary channel with its own email, etc. The remaining question was what to do with the non-music videos lost in the sea of music videos. Looking them over, I felt that there were several that contained material that is significant. I will not be porting all of my older videos. Specifically, I will be ignoring the more topical socio-political commentary. Hopefully you enjoy these videos. If you'd like to request a topic, leave a comment below. Please share, like, and subscribe. Truth is found in the rubble of falsehood. Love is the law. Love under will. With the world should be the whole of the law. This video will include two chapters of Maria De, De Naglauska's Initiatic Eroticism. This book is a compilation of articles by Naglauska from her paper La Flesh, The Arrow. I found her because she is said to be a source for Evola. She also translated Randolph's Sexual Magic. The only version of this work is from her translation. According to Donald Traxler, the translator of her works, she added significantly to that work. Randolph is said to be one of the sources for Thelemic Sexual Magic. I have been reading Euless, but it is hard going. When I read his statements of, I am a doctor, combined with, his assertions that abortion is unnecessary because the woman can push out the zygote by biting her thumb and blowing it causes me to lack confidence. Rather than reading it with an eye out for the false, I am now reading it in hopes of gleaning something worthwhile. The first article from Naglauska's book will be from page 139 titled Open Letter to Pius XI. The second will be from page 146 titled In Initiatic Eroticism. Overall, I found the book interesting and well worth my while, despite its overt religious and mystical slant. Open Letter to Pius XI This open letter appeared in the front page of La Flèche, number 19, March 15, 1934. Its placement on the front page was perhaps indicative of the importance that Naglauska attached to it. Naglauska signed it with her own name. The Pope of the Critical Hour you have said, Sovereign Pontiff, that Christianity itself is threatened with death in this terrible time when nothing is still standing. Neither faith, nor hope, nor even charity. The people detest one another. Men tear each other apart, and women no longer know what chastity is. Everyone wants only one thing. Easy pleasure, fast, stunning. They look for that because they no longer have anything in their soul, and their spirit is empty because it finds nothing. For a long time now, humans have said to themselves, Let's not trust in anything except ourselves. Let's not believe in anything except visible matter and reason, which invented mathematics. Let us chase Christ from our hearts, and let, let's proclaim openly that God does not exist. In this way we'll be free, and we'll freely exploit nature, enriching ourselves. A hundred and fifty years have sufficed for this materialism to bear fruit, and you are touched by it yourself, Sovereign Pontiff. Interiorly, mankind has become exterior, and the Church, of which you are the head, has followed in this movement. Night is in men, it is true, but it is also at the Vatican and even, alas, in your spirit. Will you tell me that I am fooling myself when I say that nothing scares you as much as true faith in a woman whose spirit is not asleep? Isn't mysticism what you fear above all? You demand blind submission from your flock because you don't believe that one can, in opening the inner eyes, see something in your church, on your altars, in your doctrine. Yes, Sovereign Pontiff, the crisis of the present hour is there, in the nothingness of your church and the nullity of your faith. Nothing but ineffectual words come out of the Vatican at the present time, because you are not sincere. Even more than in the masses, Christ is dead in you. This has been fatal, and you know it as well as I do. You are not unintelligent in the profane sense of the world, of word, and you have understood, since the beginning of your reign, that Christianity can no longer be pulled out of the swamp in which it is stuck without a new word, the word of the third term of the Trinity, the profound truth of which you know as well as I do. You know that this word was given to the world at the precise moment of your election by the conclave meeting in Rome after the death of your predecessor. You know that if you announced it yourself to the nations listening to you, humanity would be spared many evils. Humanity, having touched the bottom of the abyss, is now to begin the ascension. 
but you prefer to keep it on the exterior precipice, because you are lacking faith in your own strength. You hope that, for better or worse, the world will stay as it is until the time of your own end. This is criminal, sovereign pontiff, and it is quite doubtful that you will be, not be punished for it. The forces, still impalpable, of the new renaissance are pressing in invisible crowds around your walls. The resistance that you show that exasperates them, and if it keeps on, the clash will be furious. After the unhappiness of the crowds, it is your unhappiness that they are preparing. For you have two choices. Either you will light the torch of the third term of the Trinity under your dome, recognizing that love is not forbidden, but that it must be made sublime, or the love that you chase away will turn against you as a savage passion. The chief of the Italians, Benito Mussolini, has declared that the new generations need a mystique. He proposes to them that of distant voyages and sporting wars. Aren't you in a position to tell him that this is still only a derivative, an external consolation, when the sickness is inside of people? This sickness is called the absence of love, and it consumes men, because women, no longer having religion, no longer know how to love. All is false in a nocturnal epoch whose only spiritual light is the vague memory of an expired ideal. Have the courage to reveal the new truth. Find the strength to say that men and women are created for each other, and that in the love of the two is hidden all mystery, all wisdom, and all mystique. Allow us to stand at last to understand Dante and Beatrice, without looking for noon at two o'clock. I have dedicated to you, Sovereign Pontiff, my volume entitled The Hanging Mystery. My wish is that you may deeply understand its form and contents. Initiatic Eroticism This article appeared on the front page of the very last issue, La Flesh, number 20, January 15, 1935. Naglauska signed it using her favorite pseudonym, Auguste Apoitre. And I'm assuming I'm mispronouncing the French. No one shall have a share in the joys and the balance of the era of the third term of the Trinity, unless he resolutely engages himself with the path of initiatic eroticism. The men and women who shall remain fouled in the shadows of sex, where the man loses his reason and the woman the freshness of her primordial intelligence, will be thrown from the triumphal chariot that carries only the chosen toward the sun and glory. Those who shall be rejected will form, behind the procession of the glorious, a lamentable train of individuals without liberty. For this is true, only the victorious freedman is free. That is to say, the disciple who has been able to conquer his wild mount to make of it a courser that is bold and obedient at the same time. In traditional initiations, man's sexual appetite is first referred to as a wild horse, and later as a war courser. The wild horse carries the man who sits astride it into the labyrinth of chaotic paths. It does not measure its strength, and it gallops randomly without reason or goal. As long as humanity found itself in its first hours after the initiatic initial fall, which was produced at the beginning of our triangle, it was not possible to ask of the men of the crowd that they understand the necessity of mastering the courser. It is certainly because of that that Moses, informing the people of Israel, the people of him who had fought with God, and God is in the courser, forbid them all penetration into the mysteries of Isis, which, at this period of Egyptian decadence, were nothing more than an orgy and redoubtable perversion. Reason had founded in the Egyptian plague, and the first duty of Moses was to set it right in men. To restore erring reason, sex had to be veiled and its function limited to the duty of procreation. The law given by Moses with, was in conformity with this truth, and the people of Israel, who accepted and obeyed it, relighted the torch of reason on the earth, which cannot go out again until the end of our centuries of the fifth historical triangle. But at the end of the first era, there was a new event a spiritual revolution caused by the life and the passion of the Christ. This life and this passion of the man whose reason was complete lighted the torch of the heart in humanity. 
And man was ashamed of his flesh, and he fought it to render it amorphous. The second era began then, the era of the struggle, the era of atrocious tribulations. Nineteen centuries of suffering, nineteen centuries of foolish chimeras, such is the bill that we sign today. But these sufferings were useful to us. They prepared in us, they accomplished in us, the transmutation of savage instinct into aspiration of spiritual order. The brutal love of the first era became, in the best truly and in the others conceptually, the subtle adoration of that which the flesh contains, the soul, some say, life, answers the others. The adoration of the flesh purifies the flesh, because wishing for perfection it creates it. What is purified flesh? It is the creative aerodynamization of a density that is too heavy. Brutal love densifies the flesh and becomes because of that obscures the reason in the heart. But adoration volatilizes what is opaque and remakes of man what he should be, a creator. Now adoration leads to eroticism and replaces with the latter the simplistic practice of brutal love. Eroticism leads to the third era, the one that lights in humans the torch or the light of sex. But the touchstone is there, no one will accomplish an erotic work if he is not really adored by a woman. And no one will be adored by a woman if his game of love is not a poem. It is therefore necessary that the man and the woman should be of superior essence for there to be eroticism. But inferiors can imitate the superiors, but not knowing how to create, their work is not worth anything. It does not lead the flesh beyond itself and fortifies neither the heart nor the reason. That is why it is just to say that the love of the vulgar is an abomination. But what to say to him or her who asks himself how, from abominable, to become perfect? Alas, there is only one answer. It is very simple, but indefinitely difficult to apply. Perfect the reason and the will that depends on it. Then repeat, during a period that is more or less long according to the individual, the asceticism of the second era. And finally, find the woman who is worthy of the sacred work and provoke in her the flame of love necessary to the recreation of the man in his three principal centers. The center of reason, that of the heart, and that of sex. But how shall I tell Dante where his Beatrice is? If you do not find her yourself, no one will point her out to you. And would you like your task to be easy? If so... I am sorry for you. So, I think it is quite apparent that Niklauska was tapped into the early stirrings of the 93rd current, another antecedent of Thelema. From this one work, I see strong correlations between Niklauska and Crowley. This may change as I read her the other works, but for now I find it very compelling. I hope you enjoyed these excerpts. Truth is found in the rubble of falsehood. Love is the law. Love and her will. Thank you.